Hello to everyone. Good morning. Uh, I know that now weather is becoming much, much better and the people are not uh, any more interested for webinars, but we need to implement them. Uh, in Croatia, it's very sunny, over 20 degrees now, so we are preparing for the summer. I hope that all others attendees and panelists are also preparing for the summer and that we'll have a good summer. But before the summer, we will need to implement our webinars. So uh, this is the first uh, webinar from the series of three webinars. So I will give like short introduction and after me, uh, four panelists uh, will present. And after the third panelist, we'll have like a short uh, uh, pool, short questionnaire about uh, innovation. So prepare your uh, phones. It will be by uh, online. Uh, you just need to scan QR code. So once more, Hello to everyone. Uh, good morning. And uh, uh, I will start with uh, our uh, presentation, with my presentation and a short introduction. So what we will, what I will talking about project and program, project partners, about the coordinator CTT, uh, po uh, project aim and uh, about today lectures. So as this, uh, this is the uh information about the uh, project and program so our zev innovation project is funded by iceland Liechtenstein, and norway through ea and norway grant fund for regional cooperation so project benefit uh, from 1.6 million euro grant uh and why we got uh, this funding because uh, fund recognized that cross-border and transnational cooperation it's very important to achieve uh, goals. And we set uh, a goal for the electrification of the ships. And we think that uh, uh, using partners from Norway, uh, transferring knowledge to Croatia and Poland was a good idea. And that was recognized by the uh, fund uh, operator. So we had over 100 application, uh, 20 projects selected and one lead partner from Croatia. And this is the ZEV Innovation Project. So we started in uh, uh, July uh, last year, last year. So we are until 24. This is the first year of the project implementation. We are uh, basically at the beginning collecting, uh, uh, learning about the problems and uh, preparing our panel, uh, our, uh, our portal. So we have par five partners from Croatia, Poland and Norway. So as I said, five partners coming from uh, uh, Croatia, for, uh, uh, Poland and Norway. We have a beneficiary partner and expertise partner. So expertise partners basically transferring knowledge to the lead partner and the beneficiary partner. So expert uh, expertise partners are coming from Norway. It's OKP and the Vinco Innovation and the beneficiary partners coming from Croatia and uh, and Poland. So it's from Poland is Baltic Sea and Space Cluster from Croatia Innovacy Razvoj and Center of Technology Transfer. Uh, who is the coordinator of the project. So short about CTT, we are a company funded by uh, Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architecture in 96. So our strategic purpose is connect science and economy, uh, strengthen the role of uh, our faculty in this process uh, and act as a center for innovation and technology transfer. We have the companies in our incubators. Uh, we are also looking for the students uh, and we also have the student incubator. So activities, uh, transfer of knowledge into economy, like through the European projects, uh, to different consultation uh, between uh, professors employed on the faculty and uh, companies, and through different seminars implemented by the professor working on the faculty and expert in the field. Uh, as I said, we have incubator uh, for the startups, spin-offs, and student incubators. We are focusing mainly and we want to attract people who are working on our faculty, who finish faculty and want to open company. So to have connection between them and the faculty. And uh, about our project, uh, on the left side, you can see uh, what we have as uh, our main idea is uh, uh, in the middle is the zero emission uh, vessel. So we want to uh, uh, help companies, stakeholders, and research organization to get uh, to go more to the zero emission vessels by implementing different innovation. So we are uh, having innovation hub. Uh, we have expertise. We have a commercialization. We are helping companies to uh, commercialize their product. Uh, we will have best practice 
and uh, then we want to cooperate, collaborate with the other uh, partners and other stakeholders in preparation of the uh, of the of the new uh, project. So, so in this plenary session, uh, we will talk about establishing common language about innovation. So. Uh, one of the main goal of our project is basically innovation and helping companies uh, with uh, innovation. Uh, we will have experts employed on our project who will uh, help selected companies in the field of uh, implementation. So uh, what we'll talk today, it's a common language about innovation. Uh, what is and what is not uh, considered to be innovation? What type of innovation get mixed? Why is innovation different to intellectual, intellectual properties, right? Uh, about uh, ISO standard 56,000, uh, who is linked with innovation management, uh, about uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the maritime transport sector. So these are the four uh, topics for today's present uh, webinar. As I said, after the third presentation, we will have a short questionnaire, so short pool. Uh, so prepare your phone, you will just need to scan QR code and the uh, uh, poll is live and you will see the answers uh, during the, this uh, poll. So our presenters coming from, uh, from Norway and uh, uh, our first presenter is Barbara coming from the Vinco Innovation. Our second uh, presenter is Emma uh, coming from Conexus and uh, OKP uh, and our third is Maline. Uh, she's also from the Vinco Innovation from Norway. Uh, and the last presentation is Mr. Adekola, who will present uh, uh, COVID-19 problems in the maritime world. So this is for me. Uh, during the presentation, uh, you can always ask uh, questions, uh, and uh, uh, we will try to answer them. Uh, Barbara, you are next. So Barbara will give us introduction to innovation. What is innovation? What is not innovation? Barbara, please help us with your presentation. After presentation end, you have one or two questions, quick questions for the, our audience. So Barbara, floor is yours. You can start sharing the screen. Thank you, Boris, very much for this very nice introduction. I see we have 54 participants. Hello to everyone. It's very nice to see so many people. I see most of you are from Croatia. Hi to Croatia. I'm looking forward to come uh, to Croatia this summer. Uh, like, you know, COVID-19 has been a very boring thing and I really look forward to traveling soon. So hello to everyone and I hope um, you will enjoy the session today. So I will um, share my screen and you just let me know if you don't see anything or if I talk too fast. So, or if you don't hear me well enough. So um, let's start. And the subtitles. And this. Yes, so um, I will talk about the um, basics. What is innovation and uh, what gets confused when we talk about innovation and invention because it's very similar. Uh, and then I will give some basic information about different types of innovation and also sometimes some of the terms there also get confused and um, yeah and I hope I have some questions also for the audience so feel, please feel free to speak up when I pose a question. So the goals of my presentation there are four goals very easy ones uh, first as well to understand and to learn what is innovation how we define innovation, it's very simple. And then just for the one of, once for all, we all have this in our mind. And then based on that, we will learn what is the difference between innovation and invention. Also, we will learn what are the different types of innovation and fourth, why we need to innovate. I assume many of you are coming from the companies. I don't know if you are coming from the large or medium ones, but I will talk why innovation is really crucial as well. I have some chat. Oh, it's me, it's me. <laughs> okay, good. I thought it was a question from the audience. I will okay. ask a question, don't worry. No problem. So these are the four uh, goals for you to take away when the presentation is over. So my, um, my question to you is, 
what is innovation? How would you say, how would you define innovation? You can write in the chat or you can speak up. I'm getting a chat comment. Anyone? Every intentionality that brings sustainable benefit. Excellent. Others? I see it's a very tough question. <laughs> <laughs> you probably something already invented. Very good, Per. Action, action that has elements of novelty. Very good. The action process of innovation, a new method, product, unique approach in existing. Excellent. Excellent. So, how like are the causes unique approach and existing problem? Very good. Low production of process of innovation. So, when was the last time you innovated something? Any thoughts about how was it to innovate? Okay. So uh, when we talk about innovation, I think there are more answers per more or less every day is per innovating. Very good per, very good. So, so you gave some in some definitions of innovation, but how? What is invention then? Or how do they differ? Any thoughts there? Everyone is very quiet. It's not scary. Okay, if we, someone is, any business improvement, everything new, not necessarily implemented. Yeah, Miroslav knows the things. Uh, Domagoj, innovation, innovation is creating a new concept process or similar. I like all your answers. And uh, this is uh, where things get interesting because if you look what is innovation and what is invention, Thought is something new, right? And then we also have here some of the answers. Everything new, not um, invention is creating a new concept, process, or similar. And that's correct. Invention is solution, a product, or a procedure, and innovation is also the same. Renewal, product, or service is something new. So is there any difference? when they are so similar? Is a patentable solution to a problem? Very good at the core. And this is going to my second question, which can we patent? Adekola says it's invention that we patent. Do we patent innovation? And what is the difference? Is anyone who would like to kind of discuss a little bit with me, talk? Miroslav, I think you know the material, so you don't, so you are quite covered. Someone else who, who like, Laura had some ideas. Okay, so you were right. Both things are something new. Innovation and invention is something new. And uh, basically we can patent both of the things. And um, innovation can be something that has been patented creation of something new that does not exist. Invention, okay, um, here is something in Polish which I cannot understand. Yeah, so both things are something new. Um, invention is you get some new ideas, improved ideas, improved process and you patented. Innovation, 
can be based on a patent, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, innovation is something new as well, something new improve, but it doesn't have to be patented. It doesn't have to be patent behind it. Many businesses are very innovative, but they don't do patents for everything. And I have here Mousetrap. I don't know if some of you have been on the plenary session we had in uh, January when we talked about IPR. And then I talked about uh, Mousetrap. Mousetrap is the most patented item in US history. It has like around 4.5 thousand patents on Mousetrap. But only two make profits, only two make business, only two are in use. So we have 4.5 thousand inventions, but only two innovation. In order for something to be innovation, I think Miroslav said, well, it has to be, it has to benefit for something. Unless it doesn't benefit, it's not innovation. And many people go for the patents. I found out something new, now I'll patent it. Very well. Patents are expensive, they cost lots of money, but then you might discover that you don't have the business case. Just because something is new, you, don't, you shouldn't go hurrying and patent it. First, you should sit down and see what's the business case behind. Who is interested? Do I have someone interested that will actually maybe license out this? Will I start up a company? Uh, will there like, so you have to sit down and see how this can benefit, how you can use this. Otherwise, the money is just wasted. Unless you, of course, Microsoft or IBM who are making the big patent portfolios. And lots of people are coming also to me and say, okay, I have patent of this. Once you file a patent, you have one year to decide whether you will continue or not. And if this one year you don't have a clear answer, maybe you also don't have a money. And then if you, can, if you cannot continue to patent, then the whole idea will lapse. You don't have anything. So it's sometimes better to think twice before you hurry to patent something, to really sit down and think which business case I have, and then really strategically go into patenting when you know why and who you are going to talk, why and who you are going to license it out. So it's important to just don't patent for the sake of patents. And when you, in order to have very good innovation ideas, many ideas, it's in, you don't patent just to get innovation. First, you have to work really hard to get many, plenty of ideas, because in innovation, the quantity creates quality at the end. You have to have the pool of many ideas in order to get one or two that will be really breakthrough ideas. At the end, the value of an idea is in using it. So this is something to keep in mind. So innovation is something new, something new, something improved, but it also has to bring value. Both things have to be in place in order for something to be innovation. How you create value you can have plenty of new things, plenty of new ideas that create value and are used, but maybe never get patented. For example, Coca-Cola never get patented. Some, some, some ideas they get, they become trade secrets. Some just don't. So it's very important to be aware not to go into a um, mousetrap paradigm, not to fall fall in this trap that you want to patent just because something is new. Think about the business case behind. Think about what are the companies that are going, you are going to license out this idea, why you are patented, are to protect from who. So when there is something new thing and it doesn't bring a value, as in those 4.498 mousetraps, they don't bring any value. So they're just inventions. There's something new, there's a new way how to catch a mouse, but simply the market didn't recognize that it brings the value. So while I'm presenting, often people come and they mix those two things. So just remember, it's the diamond, it's the value, and something new.
Okay. So the types of innovation, which types of innovation have you heard about? Hmm? Have you ever heard about some different types? Okay, someone is chatting. Incremental radical disruptive, excellent. Can you, Miroslav, explain me what's the difference between radical and disruptive or give me some examples? Very good, Marek, product or process as well. Can you give me, Miroslav, example of disruptive innovation, for example? Is radical and replacing something old? Yes, that's usually the, um, Miroslav, that's usually where people uh, kind of get wrong because, um, and they usually say that Apple was um, disruptive. Uh, so the most common example I get as um, disruptive innovation is iPhone, which is not. So just to start, as uh, our Polish partner said, uh, we can. There are different ways we can um, we can define uh, types of innovation. We can go by subject. It can be product. It can be service. It can be business model, process, technology innovation. That is very clear to understand. By area, it can be an environmental, which we are doing in this Zev Innovation Project. Um, organizational, it can be social innovation. And then we have those two categories, by extent of change and by a novelty degree. Uh, electorship is a business innovation. Yes, Mark, it is. And here it gets interesting, radical and disruptive. Uh, radical extent of the change when it was beyond what we thought. Incremental or small, as a small, um, improvements that we do on a project on a product or technology sustainable is something you like it's better to say that sustainable incremental synonyms than to say that synonyms are radically disruptive because disruptive is kind of concept disruptive is when you disruptive is when you disrupt the market disrupting the market means that companies the big companies that already exist don't see your innovation coming. And they think that your innovation is not important. The big companies already existing on the market that we call usually incumbents, they, they have their big, they have their things going on and they think they're safe. They don't worry about some small materimats doing electric, electric cars in, in the suburbs of Zagreb. They don't care about that. But somehow some small startups find the interesting niche of market that is not interesting to the big companies and then start working on it. And they take this and they start to build their skills on that. And then through the time they disrupt the market. And the, one of the best example is Ryanair. You know, they get the group of people, they get the market that usually didn't travel by planes because air, uh, traveling by uh, airplanes was very expensive and only the rich people could do that. But then Ryanair came and said, well, well, we can make it cheaper so that people that are only traveling by uh, trains or uh, that don't have so much money that they want to have shorter, uh, less uh, baggage so they can afford that. And suddenly the big companies were in problem because they were taking the market share. Netflix, as well as the one of the examples. So the thing about disruptive, it, it disrupts the existing company. But the another thing is that it starts with the low end customers. It doesn't start with the high end customers. And Apple, that is usually an example of disruptive. Apple was radical and did change the market in a radical way but it wasn't disruptive because it didn't start with the low end customers. This Apple has clearly said, our customers are high end customers. We only produce products for the 
rich. So they're not disruptive. They did change the market radically, but did not do it disruptive. Okay, and then we have market pool and technology push. Uh, technology push, like for example, Apple, like when technology is in advanced Internet of Things, is technology push. Market pool is okay. We have all, uh, way too much CO2 emissions. We have to do something by that. And then we are pushing for um, innovations that will solve the problem. For example, close versus open. It was much more common before for all companies to have closed innovation that they have their R&D that are working close, they don't cooperate. But more and more companies are realizing that they have to cooperate with people outside their little world. We have technology transfer offices and they are like a CTT in Zagreb, they're the best example of open innovation putting in use. Uh, companies realize that they have to cooperate both with the people that are using the product that ca can come with very good ideas they can also co uh, cooperate with universities that are doing very interesting and maybe uh, a useful that can, uh, that can be commercialized uh, research. So, and then the whole new area and new like innovation management open and it's called open innovation. So these are one of the most, um, these are the one of the most, uh, important uh, types of innovation. As I said, radical and disruptive get a very much uh, used as a synonyms, but which they are not. According to Christian uh, Clayton Christensen, uh, disruptive is a process over the time you go from the low end customers to the high end customers, but getting first the high end customers, it, you are not disrupt, disrupting the market. According to Clayton Christensen. So, um, and here's another way to look also on innovation. And again, I will use an Apple because it's very easy to refer to it. We can have transformational innovation and Apple was that with both iPhone and iPods. Then we have adjustments and we have core. First iPhone on the market was transform transformational. It was developing breakthroughs. It totally changed the mobile phone industry. It put the screen in the center. It wasn't anymore like for calling. It was the screen and internet. But what happened when Samsung Galaxy came? Samsung Galaxy, the first one, it was new to the company. It wasn't anymore new to the industry because Apple was first. So it came in this middle category. Launching every year a new iPhone versions or new Samsung versions is a core. It's optimizing sub existing, it's improvement, it's sustainable innovation. Yes. And then why is innovation important? You have maybe already um, got idea from Apple and from, uh, uh, from uh, example from, uh, you have to have quality in order to be able to be on the market or it's called ticket to play. If you have a good enough product that people will use, you are free, you will, the market will open to you. But however, to stay on the market, you have to innovate constantly. You have to come up with a new idea, something that will improve the product, that will better match the consumer needs, the consumer problems, and this is a ticket to stay in the loop. What happened to Kodak didn't listen and they lost their tickets to stay. And which role does innovation play? Mature businesses. I don't know how many of you have heard about S-curves. They like all those new improvements, new ideas or going outside their, their, your core industry, getting new customers or solving problems, uh, delivering the value in the new way. It makes that we get more of those hops, like I don't know how to call it. If you take telecommunication industry in Croatia, uh, and uh, beginning of 2000, um, you know, the penetration rate, everyone, both uh, all the two competitors on the market, the aim was to get 100% penetration in the creation market. And what happens once you get 100% penetration when everyone has a mobile phone and everyone calls, then you have reached the top. 
then you get maturity of the market and then yield will start to fall. And in order to have a new hope, a new, new S-curve, like something you have to innovate, you have to come up with a solution that will either open for new customers that you will serve, it will open new ways how you will serve the customers. Instead of, for example, Amazon, instead of going to the shop, you will just order it online, the way how you deliver your product, your value, or maybe you will be delivering totally different value. So the role of innovation is to enable businesses to sustain long-term in the market. So you don't have the Kodak moment. Why we innovate? Mainly innovate to decrease costs. Some also innovate for the quality, to, to provide higher quality to the customers, to the market. And you can see here what happened with innovation, health and education. The quality went down, but, the, uh, but um, the cost went higher. Airlines, the quality, the, the cost went down. You can get a cheaper a ticket, but also the quality of your travel went down. However, backing and insurance are the big winners. Not only the cost went down, but it's much greater quality. You can send the money from your phone. You don't even have to go to bank. It's very easy. So the quality went up while the costs went down. That's the clear winners. And experiences, traveling, consulting, it went up because it became more complex and hence it get more, more expensive. So here are some examples. So companies usually focus when we innovate either on costs or on the quality or both. And here are the results. So if you focus if you look at the blue line, the blue line is five times better than the, 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 the black ones, which is standards and poor. Uh, this is what is the uh, value they are they're living on stock exchange. The blue line is American Customer Satisfaction Index. The research shows very clearly, the more you focus on the customers, on the value, on the quality you bring to the customers, you will be much more successful in the market and including them on the stock exchange. Five times better as this graph says. So the purpose of business, of innovation, is to get and keep customers. So we can be as much as we want, very technical, very engineering, but this will not keep company going. So remember always to have a customer in your head. And this is what makes a difference between innovation and invention. Innovation is in, invention put in use. Something that be, brings value and brings uh, benefits. Create something, the customers will be using it. So this was very short for me. This is to remember after the presentation, what is the difference between innovation and invention? Both are new but innovation is also the bringing menu, uh, a value. Remember that disruptive is different from the radical. Disruptive is serving first the low end customers and then building up. Innovation is here because we want to stay, is important because we want to stay on the market. We want to uh, like have many uh, S-curves coming. We want to serve more customers. We want to bring them better value in a new way. So in the long, run, we are much more successful and bring value to our shareholders at the end. So feel free um, to ask me any questions. We have also Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn accounts. Feel free to follow us there. We have very nice uh, videos on Instagram, uh, which you might enjoy. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, hear um, your questions. Thank you. So thank you, Barbara, for your uh, very nice presentation. There are a lot of questions, but I will just take one or two. Maybe you can prepare uh, for the end of the webinar to answer. And you can read in the chat. So a lot of them. But uh, one quick, uh, can innovation invention be simultaneously radical and disruptive? A radical and disruptive. That's excellent question, um, uh, Boris. 
uh, radical and disruptive. Of course, they can be both radical and disruptive. Or radical that they are totally different what we imagine, and disruptive is um, like Netflix is both radical and disruptive. If you, you would say. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, when you read your, uh, please read chat. Miroslav challenged you for dual. So, That's very good. Yeah. So yeah. maybe next time two of you can uh, present and uh, show uh, uh, your opinion. And uh, he also having a, a lot of question and comments. So maybe to sum up uh, at the end of the of the yeah. webinar, you can answer can, on them, and Miroslav yeah. can even well, we can, add we more can take it yeah. also offline and have a call afterwards. Yeah. And if yeah. anyone else has any questions, please you feel free to send me an email and I will be glad to schedule a short meeting, a digital coffee and to discuss anything. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, very good presentation. So we are now jumping to Emma. Emma is uh, Emma will present and try to explain us about uh, uh, standard ease of 56,000. So about innovation management, uh, you hear a lot of different uh, uh, different things. So we are, uh, ISO standard is actually trying to now to have uh, to have normalized this. So Emma, floor is your. Oops. Um, I think I'm. Can you see? Can you guys see the screen? Or yeah, 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 it's perfect. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm from um, Okupe, um in, in Norway. Um, my background is in IP management. Um, but what I want to talk to you today about is some work that the International Standards Committee has been doing recently on innovation management. Um, and as, it's, as Barbara has highlighted, we've all got very, you know, some, lots of different understandings about innovation, what it is. Um, and what invention is, what different concepts mean, radicals, in innovation, disruptive innovation, and our, our understandings of, of those concepts and innovation are very dependent on a, a lot of factors, the, the cultures we operate in, the business, business organisations we're op operating, the maturity the so of those businesses, the, the market we're in, the technology area, the social political um, climates that we operate in and the regulatory um, arena that we're in. Um, and so given all of this background, the, um, the ISO, the International um, Founders Committee got together and um, they've been working for a number of years on a project to put some standards and guidance around innovation management. So what I want to do today is to give you a little bit of background about that work and what the aims are um, and also look at one particular piece of, of that work, which is trying to establish a common language for collaboration projects. Um, one of the pieces of work focuses on particularly on collaboration and um, particularly international co collaboration between organisations and how we can have something in place to start from the same place and understand the same definitions and then I want to look at a, a reasons to use them and um, when we talk about innovation and we talk about standards it seems to be very contradictory that you can have innovation which is an organic process sometimes it can be spontaneous and yet you're the international standards organization are trying to say okay but we want to standardize it um, and the idea really isn't to standardize it, it's to give tools and guidance to different organizations so that they can point to the same definitions and, and principles. Um, so background to the ISO, um, I think we all know it's a global network of 165 different standards organizations. Um, and as of December, 2020, they, they had 22,500 different standards um, printed and published. And uh, some of them we know very well, the ones on quality management, information security and risk management. Um, and then they've gone into looking at um, sustainability management and also innovation management with ISO 5600 and ISO 8500. Um, 
so how has it been developed and why? Um, the ISO committee have worked with uh, different organisations, standards organisations in 165 different countries. They've worked with the, Euro the European Patent Office, the World Intellectual Property Office, OECD, World Trade Organisations. And so what they've aimed to do is they've not created a, aimed to create a one standard fits all document. The documents are there for guidance purposes. They're not certification standards. Um, they're a guidance document for organisations, and they're, they're meant to be passed. They're meant to provide guidance, which can then be put into play in different organisations. So it's not a one stand, one size fits all. It's just the guidance documents which organisations can look at and interpret in accordance with their their own organisations. Um, and so. The standards have been developed looking at all of these different regulatory frameworks, the patenting process and IP considerations, as well as general national and international challenges. And so the aims, um, the ISO have come out and they've said that it's to allow organisations to share best practices in innovation management, to facilitate collaboration and develop the capability to in innovate. And this is the most important thing that, that, that Barbara was, was touching on, was about bringing those innovations successfully to market because you can have innovation and you can have these wonderful systems in place but actually it's that process of finding out whether this innovation is going to be successful in the market that is the key um, and as I've said the standards they are guidance notes they're not certification standards and um, the aim is not to say to companies um, do you comply with this ISO 5, 6,000 standard? Um, if you do good, you can get a badge. Um, because the fear is that funding agencies then will begin to ask for these companies to be certified before they can receive funding. And that, that's, that's not the, the aim. Um, the aim of the standards is to provide a common language for innovation, um, some common terms, to help organisations build cultures and support innovation. There's a lot in the standards about, um, you know, how you record ideas, how you encourage employees to come forward with ideas, how you record the process of decision making, how you look at whether it's patentable or whether you're going to not patent it um, and what you do with it. One of the biggest aims is to promote collaborative innovation, and I'll go on to discuss that. Um, and then it looks at introducing innovation processes, how you evaluate um, whether you should take this one to the market or not. Um, so there's, there's some really good tools in there um, and it provides methods and ideas for measuring in innovation activity in, in your organisations. Um, so the basic bedrock of, of, of these standards is the ISO 5600 document, which sets out or tries to set out some common, com common definitions in relation to innovation, innovation management, intellectual property and knowledge. And the aim is that, that companies in different industries and different sectors um, and different countries, if they're struggling on a collaboration project, can point to these definitions and say, oh, OK, maybe we can use these as a, a starting point. Um, so they're really just to be able, as I said, to be foundation. Um, there are several parts to the, the, the standard guidance. There's the fundamentals and vocabulary that provides the definitions. Um, there's the innovation management system, um, which gives guidance on how to measure um, innovation within your, your company, how you measure it externally, number of patents, number of, you know, the amount of spend on R&D. Tools and methods for innovation partnership, this is what I'm going to go into, is tools and methods for when we are going to enter into a collaboration agreement, how do we decide how, who we're going to partner with and what we're going to do. Um, innovation management assessment is a tool that looks at measuring innovation in the company. And then there's one, tools and methods for intellectual property management. There are some other documents which haven't been um, released yet. There is a handbook for SMEs, um, the Innovation Management Handbook, which I think will be um, published later this year. That's in the final stages of approval at the moment, which is it's a very good general guidebook to organisations on what innovation management is and what they need to think about. 
as I've said, can can innovation be standardised? I is a, a difficult question. I don't feel that you can really standardise innovation because it is an or, or often an organic process. Yes, you can have tools and uh, procedures in process that can help that innovation process to collecting those ideas and to filter them um, and to try and evaluate them. Shall we go to market or not? But the aim isn't really to say, okay, this is our standard process. You can't, the idea isn't it, to shoebox um, thinking. So what I want to look at is because the ZAD project is basically um, aims to encourage uh, transnational um, cooperation and collaboration. And so I want to look at this, this guidance document that the ISO has come out with for guidance for collaboration. And it's called Tools and Methods for Innovation Partnership. And the aim is to provide some guidance for when we enter collaborations. So on deciding whether we should enter uh, an innovation partnership or not. So identifying the opportunity, um, looking at how you select partners, developing common understandings. One of the most difficult things about collaboration is, or is, is sometimes that the two parties will have entirely different expectations of what a project uh, seeks to achieve. Um, and it's usually through a lack of communication or misunderstanding. And so the, the idea is to have tools and goals that help you to communicate what your expectations and understandings are and how to manage the, the process through the collaboration. Um, it's, it's, the guidance is intended to be applicable to all types of collaborations, markets and organisations, regardless of organisation type, product, service and market sector. And so because they're aiming to make the standards so general and that you can then take them and um, bespoke them to your organisation, they are very general in their language. And that's one of the, the challenges. Um, however, the guidance notes do include suggested tools for collaboration partnerships, how you analyse and how you look at collaboration agreements. Um, and the main steps that it will take, the, 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 the approach takes you through, is for the first step, deciding whether or not to enter a collaborative relationship. So looking at gap analysis, resources, skills, know-how of the organisation today and what it needs to reach new markets. So this is an internal look at your, your own organisation. Um, can the required resources and know-how be developed in-house? So you have um, uh, uh, you have innovated, you have something, you have a, a, a solution um, or an idea. Um, it's often your organisation may be limited in that you can't take it to market. You don't have all the pieces of the jigsaw. So in looking internally, you can see, OK, what do I need to take this to market? Do I need a sub supplier to provide some of the parts? Do I need... Um, I haven't got the organisation and marketing organisation sales network. Do I need to partner up with someone that can provide me that? Um, so it looks really about how, what piece of the jigsaw do my organisation have and what do I need to get to market and commercialise this idea? And so the second one is, the second step is identifying the correct collaboration partner. So the first thing to say is, OK, who do we involve in that decision making process? Do we just leave it to the R&D team? They may have very good relationships with a certain partner or, or research organisation. Or, but um, is that partner financially viable? Um, do we need to get finance involved in looking into the background a little bit? We want a reliable partner. Do, does the operations um, network and organisation of that partner match ours? Are we going to be a good fit organisationally? Yes or no? What tools do we use to find and identify a collaboration partner? Do we use research engines, competitor analysis? Um, who should our collaboration be? Should it be a competitor? Should it be someone downstream in the supply chain? Should it be upstream? Should it be sub-suppliers, et cetera? Um, most importantly, what, what factors do we need to look at when we think about who we want to collaborate with? Um, their track record in innovation, their operational fit, their IP assets that they've got. They might have the missing piece of our jigsaw um, in their intellectual property. Um, you look at their market reputation, their financial position, 
or is ethical values more important to us in that they are sustainable, um, they're looking at sustainable products? What's their market position and what are their key skills and competences? Um, the vast majority of um, collaboration relationships fail because at the outset the, the wrong partner is chosen um, or it's a, a failure to communicate what your expectations are and who's going to do what. Um, and those are the two main problems in, in entering collaborations. And so these, these steps that the, the guidance takes you through is aims to make um, organisations think a little bit more about this process. So partner selection decision, who has the final say? Is it your CTO or is it your finance guy? And how do you document that evaluation process? Because, you know, if something goes good, you goes well, you want to document how you got to that decision. If something goes badly, you want to document how you got there as well so that you can learn for next time. And then in entering the partnership, there are steps that you need to think and have in place. You need an NDA in place before you start swapping any valuable information. You need to define the scope of the collaboration. So, OK, what piece of the jigsaw do I have? What am I going to what's my organisation going to provide? What pieces does yours have? How are we going to con contribute them and work together? And what do we think is the outcome? What is the outcome of this? What are we hoping to achieve and what should we do with it? And then formalising the collaboration. This is often another hardest part because you often deal with organisations that are so full of ideas and they want to get going. They don't want to sit down and, and write this all down. Man, this is this is going to hold us back. But it's looking at how you formalise the collaboration in an agreement. What roles and responsibilities you delegate to each other? Who owns the results? What management and reporting um, do you have in place? Process tracking and post termination rights financial budgets, warranties. So it's that kind of, of review. Um, and the reasons to use the standards, I'm, I'm not saying that the, the standards are perfect. I'm not saying that they are good, uh, a good read. I'm not saying that they're an easy read. Uh, they are very general documents, which talk about very general concepts with the idea that um, organizations take them and adapt them to their own needs and their own um, markets and their own organization but the aim of them is to encourage organizations to reflect on their innovation processes um, look at how they exploit them protect their IP and how they build a culture of innovation and so there are a market benefits they hope to grow an innovation culture and promote collaboration increase business opportunities Culturally, they, they hope, the ISO hopes that they will build a global innovation culture because of, you have that common shared language you can point to. They want to improve innovation and international collaboration. And they hope that there are organisational benefits for, for organisations using them and that they help to reduce innovation risk, reduce costs and implement more ineffective um, processes. Um, and all help organisations to better control the innovation processes they have and start making better strategic decisions, um, which the end game really for, for all, all companies to is improve the return on innovation investment. Um, that, that's really an overview of the, the standards. I haven't, um, I can see the chat feature popping up, but I haven't had a chance to go in whilst we've, we've been online. Um, Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Emma. So very okay. interesting presentation. Uh, one question from my side. Uh, do you know company which already introduced uh, this standard, 56,000? Yeah, um, funnily enough, some of the um, companies coming out of um, NTNU's technology transfer office are, are looking at them. Um, and these are... <sighs> They're right ideal size companies, I think, because they're they're coming out of, you know, they're they they've gone through a growth phase. They have a very good idea. They're in this process of trying to expand and take the product to market, um, and they're these emerging businesses are looking at them to add structure and processes whilst they're in this development phase. Um, so that's interesting. I mean, at the moment they've only been published in November, so I don't think they're they're really so well known about. Um, and that's one of the, the challenges um, 
that that is going to happen with the standards that they they this right, there are so many standards that have come out um they need to the iso need to go out and they need to publicize that work that they're doing perhaps a little bit better mm -hmm. okay so we have one question for audience uh can you say something about controversy uh creativity versus standardization yeah um i think that as a, as i've said the, the danger with looking at the standards and relying on them is is that companies begin to think that this is a, another standard like the iso in, in operational management or data security um and and they're not it doesn't aim to the the, the danger is that they see this as a standardized process you must have an ideas record sheet in place the next step is that we take it up here and we talk to at least three different members of the business and then we go and talk to here and then we need a, a r d budget of you know we need a cost benefit analysis from this step and they are that that's the danger of it that they they get taken and they get used to hammering processes that actually um hinder innovation and they create um very heavy process driven um organizational processes which actually discourage people from coming forward and and they can often be used to to discard what could be very good ideas so that's that's one of the the parts of the controversy with it and the other fact is you know how do you get create the creativity isn't a standardized process it can be, you know, some of your employees can get ideas for, from from anywhere. What you need to do is to get find a way of getting those ideas out of your employees, getting them, you know, evaluating them without hindrance, so without creating too many roadblocks to it. Um, so that that I think is is my view of the controversy between creativity and standardization is. Yes, they are good tools. They are very good tools and guidance, but they do run the risk of lending itself to one finance institution saying we're not going to lend lend um, funding unless you are you have this standard in place. And it can also be used to block ideas. It can have a counter effect. Um, but all in all, I think they are a, a good. A good document, a good a good standard, and a good guidance note for organisations to look at. Okay, and uh, uh, Barbara, you are uh, raising hand. You have the question, so you can ask. Yeah, I have a comment. I agree with Emma on this answering this. Uh, it's important that standards don't become bureaucracy. Absolutely, that they are not too too rigidly taken. But on the other way, if you think if you have a company that doesn't have in place any structures for innovation, how many creativity will come up. When people don't know if they have an idea who they will talk to, how they will talk to, how to evaluate ideas, like you have to have something in that will kind of standardize or make, make grounds for innovation to happen, including creativity, like either having workshops, either having some other solutions but like that will help people understand okay this is how we do it but it shouldn't become a burden it shouldn't become a bureaucratic burden that stops so it has to be some kind of balance and i absolutely agree with emma very good presentation emma thank you so thank you barbara thank you emma so uh maybe question at the end we will have so now next uh, presenter is uh, malena floor is your She's uh, coming from Vinco and uh, Malena, start. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much for the intro, Boris, and also Emma and Barbara for a nice presentation. My name is, as mentioned, Malena Bixets on behalf of Vinco Innovation. And I will talk to you a bit about Green Trust and how one can use this in business model development. So a bit more specifically, I will talk a bit about the sustainability agenda that we're facing today and the challenges that this creates uh, specifically towards greenwashing. And in order to try to understand these challenges further, I will talk a bit what trust actually is. What is green trust? What is it that builds trust? 
And before finishing up, I will try briefly to, to try and talk a bit about how one can use this knowledge in, in business model development to facilitate for green trust and, and face these challenges that now arise. So to start off with a bit of background, as we all know, sustainability is in high rise. It's raising, rising attention all over society and also includes our customers. Customers are generally becoming much more aware of the environmental issues at stake, which also means that they are increasing their expectations towards companies. This has in one way, of course, led to many companies now putting sustainability at the heart, having the focus in the strategies. But as sustainability is a quite hard topic to embrace for many, it also has created an incentive to greenwash. At the same time, many companies uh, face higher um, rate of accusations of greenwashing, meaning that a lot of customers generally are reluctant and a bit suspicious of the motives that companies have behind mm -hmm. taking research, for example, and shows that after the emergence of greenwashing, the general trust in green advertising has lowered from 30% to 13%. We also have a Norwegian study saying that um, respondents that were asked to name any, any sustainable company, 70% could actually not mention any. So this shows that the sustainability efforts that many businesses make every year to act responsibly are not necessarily being translated into actual attitudes among customers. So in other words, there is a distinction between companies that sincerely take this sustainability effort seriously and really are put it at the heart of their strategies. But we also have greenwashing companies that mislead customers. And the presence of these companies are creating challenges for businesses that are sincere in facilitating for green customer trust. And as we all know, customer trust is essential uh, to, su to succeed as a business. So to try and understand this, what is trust? Trust is a generally a very widely used term, uh, which also means that there exists many different definitions and explanations of what it is. It is often talked about various synonyms of trust. For example, cooperation, um, confidence, predictability, credibility, trustworthiness. There are many different words, but all in all, what is common with them is that they do not really grasp the, the entire concept of what trust actually is. A key element in trust is vulnerability. For trust to take place, one of the parties needs to be in a vulnerable position and be able and be willing to, to put oneself in such a position. Vulnerability, as you might guess, might in make, many cases lead to several different consequences which then leads to the second important aspect in trust being risk. Because without a certain level of risk or uncertainty, there wouldn't be the need for trust in the first place. Trust can also be seen as confidence in intentions, as expectations of others behaving according to commitments, could be about being honest and, and simply not taking advantage. What is important to note though, is that trust is a psychological state. So it's not a behavior that you choose to do or not to do, but it is a consequence of, of choices. It is often talked about cognitive versus affective trust. Cognitive trust is the more calculative aspect of trust. So it is based on information and rational choices. Affective trust, on the other hand, is more about emotional bond. It's about mutual care and concern. What is a bit interesting is that cognitive trust is often what is focused on when one wants to facilitate for trust, but cognitive trust is a lot more superficial than affective trust. What is though important to note is that you need one certain level of cognitive trust for affective trust to kick in. Then specifically, what is green trust? Green trust is overall about the dependability of environmental performance. So naturally it builds on already existing definitions of trust, but in addition, it incorporates how companies delivers on 
various environmental requirements. So simply put, it is trust towards the green initiatives. Then the question is, what is it that actually builds trust? In order to answer this, we firstly look at antecedents of trust. So one prominent antecedent is communication, quite naturally linked to the importance of aligning expectations and, and avoiding misunderstandings. They also have competence or expertise, which links to the notion of cognitive trust. We have satisfaction. Simply put, if you're satisfied with a product or, or an experience, you're more likely to trust the company going forward. We have integrity. Integrity means that a customer perceive a company to act based on acceptable principles. And the key here is acceptable principle. It doesn't mean act according to any type of principles. So it is about a company acting according to ways that the customers see as good. Very closely linked to this is credibility, which is more or less a combination of ability or competence and integrity. We also have shared values. This also links to integrity in the sense that it's about the customers and the company to have similar or shared values and meaning of what is seen as, as good principles, really. Lastly, we have benevolence. And benevolence is about how the customers perceive the company's willingness to do good, meaning that they see the company to be willing to do something good for other than themselves and for them as customers. As a contrast, a negative antecedent of trust, meaning something that negatively affects trust, is opportunistic behavior. So in many senses, you can see benevolence to be the opposite. Then what is it that could build green trust specifically? Here we have disclosure of information, green perceived risk, reputation, and value. Value here refers to product or service value, meaning that the the expectation and experience of price versus quality um, answers well to what the customer expected and what they needed in terms of a sustainable product or service. Recent research also talks about risk assessment and transparency, which in many ways uh, relates quite heavily to disclosure of information and green perceived risk. The question then is, what implications does this actually have for business, develop, uh, business model development? And why is this important to know? <laughs> so as many already know, I suppose, Ostevan and Pigner, they introduced the business model canvas many years ago that quite easily describes a business model and represents the business model canvas that we see to the far left in the slide here. Building on this canvas, Joyce and Pekin developed a triple A canvas that can be used to create and innovate sustainable business models. It differs in the sense that it takes a more holistic approach using the three dimensions of sustainability being both the economic, environmental and social aspect. Briefly explained, the traditional business model canvas represents the economic um, aspect then you have an environmental layer that talks about environmental risks, benefits, more of a life cycle view really of, of the business model. Then you have a social layer that talks about social benefits and, and social risks of, of one's business model. And what is important with this is that this can be used to facilitate for green trust um, in business model development. So the key element is to address each of the elements of a business model, facilitating for, for example, risk assessment and transparency as antecedents, and address this in each layer. So the overall objective should be to give customers the opportunity to address risk, uh, to assess risk and, and, and uh, see the benefits and implications that is associated with all aspects of the business model um, through the entire value chain. 
Um, what this means for a business is, of course, that it requires full disclosure of information uh, that requires uh, transparency and and um, to give the knowledge that one has as a company and, and share this so that companies customers can can make their own um, own decisions. And what is essential in this aspect is that it's not just about talking about what is good, bragging about, okay, we do all this so well. Um, it is also about being honest about negative aspects and areas in which, which will simply have too few or maybe no sustainability measures in place at all. And this leads me to my concluding remarks. So in order to build green trust and avoid greenwashing accusations, there needs to be green initiatives or green intentions to have trusted in the first place. This is not a guide on how to, to build green, green trust without being green in the first place. It's not a greenwashing step-by-step uh, <laughs> -step guide. And also the key element is that if you as a business have an ambition to build green trust and find it uncomfortable to transparently disclose risks and, and disadvantages um, towards the environment, of your business models, that might be an indication that it's time to reevaluate a bit of parts of how you do business. And the good thing is that the AAA canvas is actually a very good tool to use in identifying such, such areas. And with that, thank you very much for, for the attention. And I hope you at least take away some, some good points from, from the last 20 minutes. So, Thank you, Malina. So very nice presentation, something new for me, something interesting. Uh, one question uh, and to <clears throat> one question for you. Uh, so how one can implement green trust in the business model? Your advice, experience, how to implement something like that? Um, the key element here, I think, is to do it a bit structured. So like I mentioned, I can show you here, you have the three canvases. And it's all about going through each, each building block and each layer and see, for example, with risk assessment and transparency, how this affects each, each part. So taking costs, for example, it's about talk, uh, disclosing whether the, the price of the product covers all the environmental costs and social costs that a business actually entails and not just about, about, um, about other costs, but it's also about simply being honest about the impact that, that all parts of the business model um, uh, has. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, it was very good presentation, something new, as I said. Uh, uh, at the end, maybe there will be one or two additional questions. So thank you. Uh, I will skip now uh, for the like uh, we have small uh, uh, pool before the Mr. Adekola presentation. So I hope it will work. So uh, all attendees will need uh, need to have uh, need to have phone just to to get. Uh, uh, QR code. So basically, five quick question. Uh, very important uh, for us. Uh, I hope it uh, work. It's very simple. So basically, uh, please try to scan and uh, just scan a QR code, and uh, you will get to the website where is the location of this uh, questionnaire, uh, and we will answer them online. So it's you don't need to log in. Uh, you do not, you do not have any account. So just basically scan QR code, and uh, we can uh, proceed with these five quick questions. So I hope that all of you are already scanned. So I will start with the first one. So basically, just answer on these uh, uh, questions. So we'll see the live number. Uh, uh, so, so just uh, 
Oh, so here we're having the answer. So you can answer the up to three. Expecting a more. Uh, so this is the number is increasing at the moment five. So I think it's a very, very, you know, very easy way to get a response from the audience about uh, what factor does your company see as indicator of its success in innovation. So uh, we have 10 answers. So the highest number is the number of development project it is involved in. So most of you are thinking that this is the most of uh, important factor for your company. Uh, I see that no one is answering income generated from sales of new product because if you link it with the innovation, it's a very long process. You need to wait uh, to receive uh, feedback from your innovation. So we have 13 answers. So as I said, just uh, scan QR code and you will get uh, to the uh, to this questionnaire on your phone. Uh, it's not, uh, you don't need to log in or something like that. Uh, just quick answers. So we have 60 people, I have expecting more to log in. Uh, so we are on the 15 now. So you can add uh, three answer on the, on the, you can select three answer and the send for the each of this. Uh, Okay, this is the uh, first question. I will jump now to the second question. Uh, the second uh, question is, what do you consider are the current barriers to innovation for your organization? So you have a set of different answers. Try to look, is it access to funding? Uh, access to information on projects and opportunities, internal politics in the organization, uh, organization size, the size uh, and nature of the organization, market impact of COVID situation, other market condition. Can we, uh, is in this day uh, access to funding the biggest problem? Uh, when I had the discussion with the different uh, group uh, of financiers, they said it's not anymore the pro uh, problem with the funding, but it's uh, now problem how to spend because when people receive the funding, they are not experienced with the spending uh, money directly for the development of the new ideas, new products, and that sometimes can uh, be a problem. So. Uh, these are the questions what we are looking in our questionnaire to receive uh, and to help us in development of, uh, uh, of our uh, platform for the development of the, uh, uh, of the tools and how to help uh, different companies uh, in the innovation process. So basically, uh, our main idea is to get together and uh, receive access to funding by applying jointly on the new projects. So uh, number is rising. So people are waking up now. We have 18 people. Okay, we are on 20 uh, answers, so thank you very much. So moving to the third question, what tools, training and resource would you like to have in access to in, in any platform develop, developed for collaboration? So this is something that we are asking you uh, in order to help us with the development of the platform and maybe to share your experience with us uh, if you use some kind of the platforms uh, what was the most important from that platform uh, for you?
So now we have a little less, 13 answers. So basically are all saying that uh, information and guidance on potential source of funding schemes and application are the most important parameter uh, for you. I hope that it's easy for answering. Uh, uh, and uh, I think the tool is very innovative and it's good for the quick answers and to look at what is happening uh, during the webinar. Training on innovation management. We see that this is becoming very interesting. So information, potential collaboration opportunities and projects. So guidance on how to complete funding application. Yeah, that's something very interesting. Uh, uh, from my experience, many people uh, don't have a, a idea and uh, don't know how to complete funding applications. So this is number three. Number four, if you were to create a platform to facilitate good collaboration with external partners, what are the most important features it should contain? Is it good security and data integrity, compliance with the GDPR, internal message function, video meeting capability, document sharing, online editing of documents, online project management tools. So these are the question for uh, so to uh, for all of participants, what you think that it's the most important uh, So document sharing, online project management tool, tools for recording the ongoing development of results. So So we have 15 answers. So basically document sharing facility, online project management tools, time recording, good security and data integrity. So that's something, uh, especially if we are talking about uh, uh, innovation, then security and data integrity is something very, very important to have uh, on the online platform. So document sharing, good security, online project management tools, time recording and financial management tools for ongoing projects. So thank you very much. We have 17 answers. And the last question is, uh, what tools or process does your organization use to promote or manage internal collaboration and innovation activities? So what kind of tools are you using? So is it uh, Innovation Cloud, uh, Slack, Google Drive, Teams, SharePoint, uh, Zoom, or you have on the old emails and the uh, phone. Oh.
So you can see we have uh, a lot of different options, but uh, uh, we are basically on email, like 75% people said that we are uh, using email. And then traditional application is uh, Microsoft Teams and Zoom. Uh, then we have uh, sharing tools like Drops, Dropbox and Google Drive. So what it's typical what to expect, but I didn't expect that so many people are using email for the uh, innovation activities, but uh, okay, this uh, for internal uh, internal collaboration, maybe, maybe more focused. So uh, thank you very much all of you for the answers. I think that was the last question from my side. And uh, this is uh, for me now. I will stop uh, sharing and we will jump. So this is a finished pool. So Adekola, Mr. Adekola, your floor is now. Uh, you can start with your uh, presentation. That was the short, uh, as I say, breakout between two presentation. And uh, now we'll start with our final uh, uh, presentation. So Adekola floor is yours. You can turn on camera and Thank you. Start, start your presentation. Thank you. Um... Host Boris, can you kindly enable my video? Right now, I can't initiate my video. Ask to start video. Do ah, it's working right. now. Thank, thank you very much. Good. So, um, thanks for having me. Um, and I'd like to present very quickly from a paper that I just um, completed, um, at least the, the COVID period has been a very good time for conducting research. Um, let me see, the screen sharing, good. Very good. Um, the topic of the paper is um, perspectives on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the maritime transport sector and the potential implications for maritime governance. Um, just very briefly about my background, um, I work as a CEO with a small consulting company based in Oslo, AO Blue Economy and Energy Consulting. Um, I studied at the Norwegian School of Economics in Bergen, um, which is a very beautiful city and very strong in terms of the maritime activities. Um, I've been a previously a visiting researcher at the London Business School, focusing on the as a part of the Energy Markets Group. Um, also had some experience with uh, McKinsey and Company in Oslo and Ethnos Veritas, which is also a maritime consulting company. Um, today, AO Blue Economy and Energy Consulting, we work and focus on blue economy governance, strategy advisory, project management, and also event organization, focusing on the energy and maritime sectors with a significant competence in sub-Saharan African markets. Though, of course, we work, do a lot of work in Norway too. Um, the paper had a number of objectives, the first of which was to examine the shorter and longer term impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the maritime tra transport sector at the global and developing country levels. Um, the paper was, the narrative was focused on Africa, both looking at the global and Africa, but the insights are generalizable to different economies. So you could have in Eastern Europe, you could have in Asia and different parts of the world. Um, the paper also aims to identify the developing country priorities for the maritime transport sector in the post-pandemic era and to examine the role of maritime governance in the post-pandemic era also. 
to re identify the relevant governance frameworks um, for developing country maritime transport sectors. And finally, to examine how these frameworks should be impacted or may be impacted as a result of the pandemic. Um, the paper was published in March um, in the World Maritime University's Journal of Maritime Affairs. So very quickly, as a background on the emergence and international spread of COVID. Most of this we know, but I'll very quickly summarize. Um, on, in December 2019, um, we understand that the World Health Organization became aware of the pandemic of COVID-19 through a media statement that was published by the Wuhan Municipal Health Commission. By 2020, the 13th of January, um, the first international case of COVID-19 was reported in Thailand. By the a couple of days later, the 16th of January, um, a case, a second international case had been reported in Japan. Um, the next week, the 21st of January, the first case in the Americas was confirmed in the United States. In Europe, um, the first confirmed case was in France, or at least three confirmed cases on the 24th of January. Um, you had the spread confirmed to the Middle East um, just five days later, um, basically in the Eastern Mediterranean in the United Arab Emirates. By the end of the month, given the rate of spread, the WHO declared um, COVID-19 has a PHEIC, that is a public health emergency of international concern. Um, by the middle of February, the first confirmed case was recorded in Africa, that was in Egypt. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, the first confirmed case was on the 27th of February. And the rest, as we say, is history. Now, a lot of insights have come out and a number of papers have been published um, since the onset of the pandemic. So just to summarize, what we know is that first, the global maritime transport sector has been significantly impacted by the pandemic. Um, a paper by March um, and others from last year, they utilized um, electronic data from maritime vessels, um, automatic identification systems, um, in order to show the sustained disruptions and regional slowdowns in shipping, amounting to several weeks along established transport routes in Asia, Africa, and Europe. So it's no longer just anecdotal, but they actually had the data um, to prove it. Um, Notebun and Palace um, also last year identified in the International Association of Ports and Harbors um, annual survey of ports. The they found out the following things. They found out that approximately 33%, now this is a survey that looks over a very broad um, number of um, ports, maritime ports in different parts of the world. They found out that close to 33% of the surveyed ports reported a decline in port calls made by container vessels of anything between 5 to 25% compared with a normal year. So a lot of variability. 16% of the surveyed ports reported declines in excess of 25% in port calls made by cargo vessels relative to a normal situation. Also, the International Chamber of Shipping and the International Transport Workers Federation estimated as at the 4th of September last year that more than 300,000 seafarers globally remained stranded on board commercial vessels, unable to be repatriated and going past the expiry of their contract tenures. So we had a crisis in that regard. Now, focusing on the global maritime sector, what were the concrete impacts of um, the COVID-19 pandemic? First of all, focusing on the short to medium term, so um, a space of roughly from the moment to you roughly have within a year or so. We noticed a drop in the volume of trade transported by maritime shipping um, due to the attendant global economic contraction that came with um, the pandemic. 
excuse me. Also, there were route disruptions as shipments normally transported by air cargoes were routed to maritime transport. So that was a benefit for maritime transport globally. But you also had an increase in cases of blank sailings, in which cases um, cargo ships, um, where it was considered too expensive because they did not have enough cargo, too expensive to go into a port and incur port demerit fees, they basically skipped their schedules. So you had what you called blank sailings. So that basically um, increased um, the amount of delays in global supply chains. There was a decline globally in maritime shipments of crude oil and there were significant increases in underwater oil storage due to drops in global oil demand and price. So this was also attendant with the global economic performance. Um, as a result, of course, um, due to the worsening economic situation, um, a growing number of vessel defaults and maritime bankruptcies were recorded globally. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, there were problems with um, crew changes on vessels. So you had the attendant emotional, you had the attendant health um, issues, and basically it became a health and safety issue. So that is still one of the key um, takeaways from the pandemic that needs to be resolved. That is the problem with the human aspect. Finally, there were difficulties in ex enforcing the newly um, reg new regulations by the IMO, which is um, MAPOL, um, which came into force in January last year um, because basically port authorities had restrictions on being able to board vessels in order to see if they were in compliance with these regulations. Over the longer term, what we find out is that um, the crisis exacerbated the effect of trade tensions, existing trade tensions between the United States and China, and also due to Brexit. In terms of geopolitics, um, the crisis, the problems with the global oil markets, um, and the difficulty in transporting um, needed um, supplies and food to countries on the embargo like Iran and Venezuela, it worsened the effect of already existing economic sanctions. Structurally, um, the pandemic has provided a catalyst, which you might see as positive in the longer term, has provided a catalyst for adopting automation, new technologies, artificial intelligence, and increased digitization in the maritime transport and supply chains. So basically, in order to reduce risk as well as to cut out the variabilities concerned with um, human personnel. In terms of regulation, we have seen that the pandemic has also mentioned, um, has affected, and in future, it may affect the capacity of port state authorities to conduct onboard vessel inspection and the manner in which inspections are conducted. So maybe many vessel inspections will now be conducted uh, um, from land remotely, and that might require the writing of entirely new procedures, which we don't know how much that is going to cost or what that's going to be in practice. Finally, Environment, environmental incidents and activity and activism. Because of the pandemic, the pandemic has heightened concerns and as a result, over the long term, that might play out by compelling actors within the maritime sector to recognize how important environmental sustainability and resilience is and how this eventually feeds back into the sector, into the bottom line. So, now sustainability, as we say, is now center of the table. It's no longer a side issue, but it has to be worked directly into business plans in the maritime transport sector. Now, on very quickly on the importance of innovation to the maritime transport sector. What we know is that prior to COVID-19, the maritime transport sector globally has been subject to multiple pressures which have been compelling a change in its structure. So basically, it comes about the terms of 
the disruptiveness of the structure or and what new forms the business models are going to take within the maritime transport sector. A number of these pressures include the following. First of all, you had technology drivers which were inducing structural disruptions in the way, the fundamental way that shipping is organized around the world. So you had issues of automation, issues of artificial intelligence, digitization, autonomous vessels, so should humans continue to be um, a consistent factor on vessels or are we moving to a place where you remove human beings completely out of the question or do we have a sort of a hybrid solution? We have talked in this lecture about um, electrification of ships. Um, what would that mean or ways of making ships operate that will reduce their environmental impact? Secondly, you another pressure has been the increased regionalization of maritime traffic. Um, that has been significantly observed in Asia, perhaps in addition um, due to the existing geopolitical and trade um, issues between the United States of, and China. You found out that a significant amount of um, maritime transport started to take place within the regional hubs of Asia rather than globally. So what effect will that have over the longer term? Will it be sustained over the longer term is yet to be seen. But that was a pressure on the maritime transport sector. Um, thirdly, you also had a global restructuring of supply chains um, with the larger significant consolidations by the major actors, um, partnerships globally, um, as well as, so that was on the shipper side, the global shipping side, then we also have noticed an integration by shipping networks into inland multimodal networks. So you have cases like AP Mash, um, not only operating a port terminal, but also buying onshore delivery parts of delivery networks. So they are guaranteeing basically door-to-door door-to-door -door delivery that's essentially they are competing on the um, fast economy or the inland hinterland economy. So that is changing the way the industry works. And fourthly, you've had a reduction, um, a pressure to reduce the negative environmental impact from maritime operations. So issues like electrification, issues like slower sailing ships, issues like how to restructure um, the pattern of um, global freight in order to reduce the climate effect from shipping. These were things that were already in play before COVID-19. But what we find out is that since COVID-19, the pandemic has merely reinforced these pressures. So the speed of change with which technology drivers, with which regionalization, with which a restructuring of the supply chains and the importance of um, environmental impacts, the speed with which it's impacting the maritime transport sector has nearly been increased. So basically what was meant to happen maybe over the next 20, 30 years has been brought closer to happen within perhaps the next 10 years or so. Um, so post-pandemic, what we need is that in order to ensure the maritime sector's competitiveness, and this is globally, um, we require the maritime sector to be more efficient and more predictable, which means less risky, or even if it's risky, there have to be instruments to mitigate the risk. Um, so you have things like insurance, um, new types of insurance, and so on and so forth. Um, the industry needs to be resilient because um, while the pandemic was, well, you might call it a black swan, but there are also ideas that um, we might be moving into a phase where black swans might be less of um, outliers. So you might have a lot more shocks on the near horizon. And then, of course, the industry needs to be more sustainable. So these are all issues that are coming to be mainstream and will be relevant in discussions in boardrooms in the post-pandemic period. Also, um, we know that maritime ports, which for some time might have been seen as going 
out of fashion are have regained an importance has a key link in maritime supply chains and the unique thing is that now it has been realized that maritime ports and the organization of these ports have a potential to drive the green conversion that is the the new methods the new ways of doing business in global supply chains um and finally um we identified that innovation and enhanced collaboration in addition to a change in mindset in the way it's been often said that shipping is one of the most conservative and um yeah non-changing industries um that exist in the world but that remains to be seen definitely there is a need to change mindsets there is a need to inspire new ideas there is a need to look at new business models that will be applicable in the maritime sector of course shipping will still be about moving things from here to there but the way it's it's going to be done now has to tap into the different technological possibilities that are now out there now um in closing moving to a close i identify some imperatives for the maritime sector in the post pandemic area um one is the importance of developing ports and related services given the importance or the renewed so to speak the the ports are back um the renewed importance of ports ports has a location for innovation ports has a location for um startups ports has a location for integrating different areas and basically hubs of maritime activity hubs has the gateway to the hinterland so ports are having a comeback now and the importance of how to structure them is very topical then you have of course maritime safety and security um during covid um the covid period you have had spikes in um in maritime hijackings unfortunately a number have taken place in um, the gulf of guinea um where it has spiked that might also be certainly due to the impact on regional governments um focusing on other things so not placing enough focus on maritime safety and security but that is definitely an issue now then um developing the significance of shipping um shipping needs to be developed um particularly in other parts of the world because at the end of the day shipping provides one of the best um possibilities for being able to move um cargo over long distances in a cost effective way that can also be climate friendly <coughs> excuse me um also we need to look at the importance of implementing holistic strategies for the blue economy so the oceans as a whole are more than just shipping the whole oceans can sustain entirely new industries which can be significant to gdp growth in the future <coughs> there is a statement that we call sea blindness which is where people do not understand the potential from the sea so they do not recognize the value of the resource that lies out there that is sea blindness that needs to be tackled and finally there is a need to promote maritime innovation new ways of doing business um disruptive ways of doing business <coughs> excuse me right that needs to be addressed also and that is a topical issue <laughs> I close very quickly by looking at the role of maritime governance in the post-COVID era. Excuse me. First of all, we know that maritime governance is crucial towards achieving positive and sustainable development outcomes in the maritime transport sector in the post-COVID nineteen era. <coughs> Now. The role of maritime governance is essentially threefold. The first is to facilitate the inclusion of all stakeholders who should be party to the process. The second is to ensure that the process is equitable and sufficiently transparent. Um the third is to provide appropriate and adequate incentives for stakeholders participation and also to minimize um well um 
basically strategically or free riding behaviors. Now, to go in a little bit into the into the um, details, when we say facilitating the inclusion of all relevant stakeholders, that means viewing an entire value chain that is now a maritime value chain or supply chains as interconnected and thereby constituting a community that needs to be consulted when decisions are made affecting any part of the value chain. So essentially what we're saying is that whatever happens with the ports, you do not just speak with the people who run the ports. You have to speak with both the shippers, you have to speak with um, the suppliers, you have to speak with even the people who maintain on land or inland transport systems. Secondly, when we speak about an equitable and transparent process, we are talking about a process that is able to mitigate power asymmetries in a supply chain and prevent it from being hijacked by powerful interests. Um, finally, when we speak about the appropriateness and the adequacy of incentives, these are such that they need to be structured such as to eliminate the tendency of individually rational actors to free ride on the costly commitments of other stakeholders in the value chain. So you are talking, coming back to a basic problem of mechanism design here. Finally, maritime governance may in principle be utilized as an instrument to promote innovation and has a follow-up to existing innovative processes. Now, so that being said, um, the paper opens up for different ways of extending um, what it has found out. The first way to extend the insights from the paper will be to examine the relative benefits and costs of alternative maritime governance frameworks for developing countries and of course for developed countries in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. The second will be to examine the relevance, the value and the viability of stakeholder governance models to the maritime sectors in different sorts of economies, both developed and developing. Um, the third is to identify how to adjust a basic stakeholder governance model, basic stakeholder theory, to make it suitable for adoption in different maritime environments because what works in one place does not necessarily work in another place. And finally, to examine the nexus between maritime governance and innovation and how governance and the way the institutions around governing the value chain, the maritime, the global supply chains, um, how governance can be used to promote innovation, particularly in developed country, developing countries. And then, of course, that is also relevant for even the more developed maritime economies. Yep, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Adekola. It was very good and uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, we you. have some questions from the audience. I will try to combine and include also mine. So how to explain the very large increase in the container handling imports? Are logistic chains resistant to COVID-19 compared to the small shipyards? Uh, construction of the small boats because uh, I know from uh, my communication with the producers uh, they're facing a big problem at the moment so is the innovation maybe the solution for them so now it's actually very hard to work when you don't have the orders for the new ships and on the other side you have uh, logistic which is working perfect in this situation so your experience uh, in this field okay Okay, now, if I understand the question, how do we explain the very large increase yeah. in container handling in ports? Um, logistic chains resistant to COVID-19? No, they're not resistant. But um, what we know is that um, minus a few hiccups, um, basically in terms of the problems with seafarers and all that, I believe, and of course, we all saw what happened with the evergreen situation in the Suez Canal just um, a few weeks ago. The maritime transport chase, um, sector has apparently performed quite well. 
on the whole. Right. And then um, in container handling, well, I would say it has increased. And a reason is because essentially you have different ways of transporting things um, by ports. But I believe that the, gr the largest growth in terms of cargo handling has been in the container sector. So um, it's basically because um, different means of cargo are now being shifted, are now being containerized. So essentially, um, when you have a growth in container handling, is because what was being transported by other means is now being done by containers. Um, and then globally, um, ships are developing, are growing in capacity. So now you have extremely large carriers, um, which is developing a lot of capacity in the industry. So I believe that um, container handling is expanding, one, because there is an investment in capacity. And that investment in capacity is coming on stream. And also because um, cargo is being moved from other means of transport into containerization. So that is making it uh, increasing the volumes. And of course, new technologies are making, new technologies, larger ships are making the use of container ships a lot cheaper um, per unit. So the cost of moving containers is also going down compared with other means of transport. So I believe a combination of these factors is what is leading to what you might call a surge in, um, in container handling. And then another factor, just in closing, could also be the tendency for regionalization. Um, I don't know, um, Marek, who apparently asked this question, I don't know if you're speaking about an experience in a specific port. A possible reason, I don't know, so one has to look much closer at it, but you've had um, a reshoring of global supply chain. So because of the pandemic, what before used to be transported all the way from China, for example, um, people are now looking at much nearer um, or shorter supply chains. So you might just have that the increased demand is because what previously was coming from Asia is now coming from, for example, Croatia. If I assume that you're based in Croatia, um, it might be coming from that. So that might also explain a surge in certain regional parts. Um, I hope that helped a little bit. uh thank you thank you so and there are no more questions related to this presentation uh thank you mr adeko thank you very much for this interesting presentation and to sum her up i have one question for barbara and emma maybe you can help me uh i heard very interesting uh, i had very interesting discussion uh with my colleagues and uh, they said that it's linked with the blue sector it's linked with the uh, shipyards in the construction of the ship so in the past uh, ship industry used to be a leader in innovation so they are setting up innovation but nowadays uh, if you look for electric vessels electrification everything is in the sector of the transport or the car so and now uh, now uh, ship industry is actually applying the innovation so from your experience or do you have any experience with this is it easier to lead innovation or apply innovation uh, uh, you know now it's completely different so i had discussion with the people so now they need to implement existing solution uh, in the in their product in their final product and yeah. they used to developing so your experience <laughs> um i mean i've i've had some experience with this um because a lot of um the work 
that I used to previously work for Rolls Royce and Kongsberg and the um, autonomous shipping team used to have this a lot because they would come up with inventions to do with the sensors and how the sensors were reading what was on board the vessel and how it was going to control where it was going to go. Um, and that that technology and that that in innovation that they were developing um, wasn't patentable because it was already out there in terms of in terms of autonomous cars, um, and that was a problem for them because they would then have to map how what freedom they had to develop these sensors and tools. Um, because you know, were they going to tread on the toes of someone else's patents that for Tesla, etc., that had produced them for the cars? So it does have a, a pretty big impact. Um, and one surprising impact was that some of the companies that have the sensor technology patents um, in the automobile industry are finding themselves with a new revenue stream in terms of licensing when it comes to incorporating that technology into autonomous vessels. So it is very interesting. I think you're very right that it is coming from a lot of the innovation in autonomous definitely is coming from cars, the automobile industry first. Yeah, this, and this, this, you, yeah, yeah. This is very good explained, Emma, and I think it's, um, as you can hear from Emma saying, uh, they had to license out. So it's important uh, to, um, um, so it's important, like, it should not be a problem that it goes from one industry to another. It's actually good and it's good for the industry to take new innovations, inventions from other industries because it can enrich it. And we saw it that the car industry is now taking the lead before it was shipping. So uh, what gives benefits for the whole, that's what counts. And of course the companies will, will benefit from licensing out at the end as well. So, and I think this is just the way to go on to like, why, why the point is to take from other industries and to use it of course, in the legal terms. Yeah, I completely for, forgot uh, that uh, car industry and uh, let's say phone industry, they're patenting a lot. And I didn't think about uh, that problem in, the, in this uh, sector. So it's uh, uh, interesting. And my second question is also Emma or uh, Barbara, uh, situation with the innovation and uh, at the moment after this uh, COVID situation, because uh, now innovation is taken by uh, and must be taken by the big companies. In the case of, the, I'm I'll, again talking about uh, uh, shipping and the ship sector and development of the ship. It's now taken by the big company or must be taken because uh, the small company have the problem and uh, they didn't operate almost one year. And we know that uh, uh, innovation and implementation of innovative solution is very expensive. So is this going to slow down this uh, sector or uh, innovation or how big companies react to this? Do you have any experience, uh, especially Emma, you said you worked. So how big companies uh, looking on the, this compared to the small one? I think there's a lot more freedom on the, the smaller companies and what I have seen, although it's not in the, the marine sector um, specifically, is that the COVID pandemic and people working from home has given a lot of people that come up with great ideas an opportunity to reflect. And so there are a, an increased number of startup companies and people coming through with ideas for different products, even though they're not in the marine sector, because they've had an amount of time that they wouldn't usually have to come up with these ideas and, and try and test them and develop them. Um, with the big companies, it, it, that's also happened to a, a certain degree as well. I'm seeing some projects being entered into which surprised me that I wouldn't have expected them to have normally seen. I think the and for research and development, that there, there's been a pause. It's given companies, because they can't, travel they can't concentrate on a lot of the normal activities it has given them a pause and chance to look internally at their research and development mm. um so i think it's 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 true for both 
and yeah. I think a lot of the, the bigger a lot of the bigger companies of course have got the the um, access they've got the systems in place the process in place they've got access more access to funding um, and I think that's the the major um, distinguisher in the in the maritime sector at the minute. Yeah, yeah. If I may add to what Emma was saying, and I agree with her uh, what she's saying. Uh, if you look like the differences with, between the big and the small companies when it comes to innovation, um, usually uh, there comes uh, more uh, disruptive innovation or more radical innovations are coming for the small companies from the startups. Um, they are uh, much easier to um, adapt to the new situations, uh, while the big ones are like, you know, like, like tankers, like a giant, it's very difficult for them to adapt. But then what is happening with the crisis is coming. Or like in addition, the small companies usually they don't have uh, all the resources when it comes to the people skill, like the, the, the human and the know-how uh, which they're lacking and also the financial resources while the big companies, they have much greater muscles to work with uh, when it comes to innovation. So the financing for the big ones is usually not the problem. And then we have a crisis. And if we learn from financial crisis 2008, we learned that uh, the number of startups shrunk, that it means it was lower. And as you, Boris, also said that they had more problems with financing uh, because they have to be, they, they were a little bit idle uh, due to the pandemics. Uh, but also, as Emma said, like the COVID-19 put everyone on pause and to think differently. Uh, and what the governments did, especially Norwegian governments, they pushed lots of money uh, into R&D projects, uh, governmental funding for R&D, because they know that in the long term, in order to uh, offset the crisis effect, they have to focus on R&D, uh, on R&D activities. And everyone who has been focusing very much on R&D and innovation uh, will have lower um, crisis effects, uh, lower negative effects. So... Um, and then also what another uh, impact of COVID-19 is that it showed to the big companies how fast they can actually adapt to the new situations. So this is like something that I don't know if how, how much these big companies will take this into it, into itself, but they showed that within a week, everything went on the home office and they were able. So they, 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 they adapt much swiftly than they usually. There was much more res uh, uh, reluctance to change before. Oh, we cannot do this. Oh, we are too big. This is slow. It will take years. But suddenly, yes, we can do that very fast. So if they will be learning from this, it will be very good for big ones. But for small ones, I hope they really get the opportunity of taking the governmental uh, funds available in order not to, um, not to be very negatively uh, uh, influenced by the crisis. Yeah, and uh, yeah, thank you, thank you for the uh, clarification and answers. So, and I think again, uh, innovation actually helped us, like uh, online tools, different online tools. So uh, everything is implementing online. Uh, meetings are continuing. So this is actually applying from one sector to another sector solution. So basically, some good results came out from this COVID nineteen situation. In Croatia, we like to say they needed like uh, five days to switch uh, to change from paper to QR codes. That was not possible before. So they are advancing even our government. So uh, thank you all for the presentation. Thank you all for the answers, communication. Uh, thank you all for attendees. Uh, I like to close now our webinar. It will be online, uh, all presentation will be prepared and uh, online for uh, attendees. Uh, you will uh, receive them. And if you have any question, please feel free to contact me or any uh, uh, other uh, panelists. So thank you very much and bye-bye. Uh, See you on our next webinar. Bye. Bye, thank you. <laughs>